Good evening. I know it's three minutes early, but I'm so excited about tonight's topic. I thought I'd start this a little early to give people a chance to tune in if you're available. Hope everyone's having a great day. There was a very interesting thunderstorm here in DC, but then we ended up with a rainbow. So that was kind of cool. So if you're uh, watching, give me a comment and uh, we'll get started with this conversation. We're going to be talking about how to travel after COVID and what will be different. A lot will be different, but we'll talk about all that. I have lots I could talk about, but I'm going to wait. <laughs> There's so many things in the pipeline that I'm tempted to tell you about. I had an interesting call today um, about a group trip that I'm planning. Can't say more yet. I've got a new product launching hopefully Thursday, maybe Friday. Super excited about that. I've been totally immersed in creating that the last two days since Sunday. Is today only Tuesday? Yeah, it's Tuesday. And let's see, what else? We got our flavors and fun coming up. It's a great Mother's Day present. I would love for you to buy that for your mother. We already had somebody buy one for their mom. Uh, somebody bought as a, as a birthday present, the Irish, the Ireland um, flavors and fun. And uh, her mom was thrilled. One more minute. Before we start, hope everyone's doing well. Everybody's getting vaccinated. New Jersey did something really funny. I actually think I'm going to wait to talk about New Jersey in a second about what they're doing with their vaccine because it is really, really funny and I wanted to make the cut. I feel like a little kid on Christmas waiting for the <laughs> waiting for the clock to turn to eight o'clock so we can go downstairs to get the presents. I know everybody's very excited about travel. Not quite there yet, but good news every day. Okay, it's eight o'clock and we're gonna get started. Um, welcome to the second edition of our Premier Wellness Travel Tailored Trips to Transform Week. Um, we are celebrating travel all week because uh, tomorrow, on Cinco de Mayo, officially, that's Travel Advisor Day. It has been for years. Um, where uh, travel advisors celebrate, excuse me, the work that they do. And they've turned it, originally, I thought they were just turning it into a whole week. I, I decided to turn it into a whole week. Then I found out that um, the, uh, the American Society of Travel Advisors had turned it into a whole week. And then it turned out they're doing a whole month-long campaign with Politico. So, um, yeah, so I'm only going to do this every night this week, but tonight we have a very exciting topic, which is how to travel after COVID and what will be different. I want to um, tell you to be sure to stay tuned to the end because I have a nice surprise at the end, a nice announcement that I'm making. And I wanted to also give a shout out to the woman, the female uh, floral designer, her name is Ursula, who designed these. She's with... Uh, Floor DC, this is her card. I wanted to give her a big shout out. Her name is Ursula Gunther. She's amazing. And for May the 4th, May the 4th be with you, she um, did a wonderful quote from Darth Vader. One of the things her work is so beautiful about is that she uses negative space very well. And so you should go check her out on Instagram. Her photos look like Dutch paintings. So I wanted to give her a shout out for this because it's so beautiful and you should know about her um, if you're in DC. Um, okay, so uh, I don't know if you've heard this term called quarantine dreams. Quarantine dreams are dreams that we have during quarantine about where we want to go. I just learned that term this week. I think it's a great term. All sorts of new um, 
new words coming out of this pandemic. And so um, I just wanted to talk about a little bit about uh, what's going to be happening in the travel industry. I have like 10, 10 sort of general points to make. I do have a blog post about this. I'm not going to read the whole blog post. You can go and read it yourself. But I just want to kind of go through the outline. And everybody's been talking about the fact that um, there's two, two things off the top that I want to say. A one, that it's not going to be like an on-off switch. It's going to um, probably start in fits and starts. And there's going to be a lot of um, shaking out happening until the vaccine situation and the vaccine passport situation actually gets settled. There was actually an article today um, reporting on um, the World Travel and Tourism Council. Uh, President Gloria Guevara was talking and stressing about the importance of having consistency across the board. Um, that that's the only way that we're going to get back to travel um, to focus on a digital uh, transition to enable a seamless travel experience. And that just means that everybody needs to coalesce around <laughs> one vaccine passport app, probably. Um, but it's not going to happen very quickly, I don't think. Um, so that would be fits and starts. So that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, she just, this literally just is hot off the press today, an article, um, May 4th. And she was speaking to a collection of tourism ministers at the G20. So um, if you're interested, I'll be happy to send you the link to that. And then um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that everybody's talking about a new normal. And I think of it more as the next normal. Travel has evolved a lot over the last hundred years. A hundred years ago, most people didn't travel except if you were very, very affluent. Um, but obviously, travelers have, you know, people have traveled from ancient times. There are some great old, um, literally from like the Greek times, travel logs that you can, that exist. And so travel's always happened, but it's usually been just for the upper class. It's only been in the, in the last 50 years or so, um, that, uh, people would get on airplanes and, and go to Europe. Even in the fifties, when my parents were young, um, you would just get in your car and drive for your holidays and you would go somewhere you could drive to, um, except for the affluent. And so I, I, I think, Going forward for the foreseeable future, it might stay that way to some extent. Um, and it, travel is just going to evolve. Also, 9-11 changed travel um, and, and made airports looking into bunkers. And um, I think that's going to change too in some way. So travel is just going to be reiterating and evolving um, as we reemerge from this in some very specific ways. So just wanted to keep that in mind. So the first... First change is that everybody is going to be more conscious with their travel. Um, everybody's more conscious generally because of the things that were taken away from us over the last year. Um, but we're more aware of how travel affects us and why we, why we want to travel. We're more aware of how travel affects economies because we've seen um, places that rely on tourism really struggle. And we have also seen the effect of of travel on the earth. There were stories early on about, you know, being able to see the mountains in India and, and seeing the Himalayas and about wildlife returning um, to the suburbs and places in the United States or um, fish swimming back up at the canals of Venice. So early on, we all became aware of, more aware of the effect on travel, on, on the world, on us, ourselves and on um, on different economies. So we're just going to be more conscious in terms of our choices because we understand that with our money we vote and we can affect how travel is going to go be going forward. And that's certainly something that I'm focusing on in the trips that I design and plan. Secondly, it's going to be more still. I think the, the time, at least for the foreseeable future, of dashing around and hitting like five cities in, in you know, 10 days is over for the time being, and that it's going to be not just more still, but slower and longer. We're going to have more of a sense of place. You're not going to have, you're not going to see as much of, you know, Maui in Mexico or um, an Italian restaurant or Italian something in Scotland. There's really um, going to be more emphasis on a sense of authenticity in a place and, um, so slower, deeper, and, um, and longer. Also long-term rentals. People will be renting and staying in a place for a long time as well. And that's already was a trend that'll continue. 
and just to go and be in a place for an extended period of time and maybe using that place to do day trips from. Uh, number three is more silence. That means quieter. Part of that is going to be because more activities are going to be outdoors. Dining's outdoors. We'll be out, outside where it's quieter. You won't have sound bouncing off the walls and off hard surfaces indoors. So that makes sense. Um, but also we're not going to have um, bustling restaurants either because um, places are going to, tables are more spread apart. It's going to be quieter and more, more silent because hotels are not booking to capacity. They're deliberately doing that to help with social distancing. So what was once a, a very crowded hotel and with resorts of people crawling all over each other to get to the buffet table, there's going to be no more buffet tables either for the foreseeable future, maybe ever again. Um, so that's going to be different as well. Um, also, the airports are going to have are going to be quiet. And as I mentioned at the top, after 9-11, they became looking like military bunkers. And I think the new airports, LaGuardia, obviously in New York, is working towards this. It won't be finished until 2025, but it's working toward in this direction in terms of design. Um, but Singapore, for example, already has it. You're, the airports are just going to be a lot more serene, a lot more spacious, and and not feel like military bunkers as, as we move forward and as we rebuild our airports and our infrastructure. And around the world, I think you'll see that as a trend. If you haven't ever Googled the sculptures at in Singapore, um, there's a beautiful um, water sculpture with birds that go up and down. I mean, it's very meditative, so you should at least go look that up. So I, Singapore is, in my mind's eye, is is sort of the epitome, and they were already there, and that's we're going to see more of that in airports as well. Um, four, number four, it's going to be more intimate. That means more private. Um, we're going to have <clears throat> private dining, private villas, um, more private buses. You're not going to have like huge buses with 60 people of tours. The tours are going to be smaller. I would also even say with mega cruises, I think those are going to go out of style. We're already seeing a, a big trend in micro cruises, which is like a hundred people or less, um, and even smaller. Uh, for doing uh, really good and interesting adventure or expedition tours. So they're called micro cruises. I actually have a blog post on them coming up. Um, so, and, and again, things are just not going to be at full capacity. So your travel experiences will be more intimate. Travel is going to be more complex for the foreseeable future. I've been talking about this in my Sips and Spotlights quite a bit, um, but not only are we um, having uh, complications in terms of what countries open, it matters like where your passport's from, where you're traveling from, where you've traveled through, what it's like on the ground and what you're allowed to do when you're there and what you need to get back. And so those are those things tend to be changing constantly. And so it's definitely going to be more complicated travel for the foreseeable future until things really settle down, um, which will hopefully be soon. I would also, my sixth point is that there's going to be more investment. And I don't just mean financial investment. Um, people are going to be willing to spend more money on their travel because they didn't travel last year. And so now they want to splurge and indulge uh, since they had didn't have a chance to travel last year. Completely understandable. But there's going to be a lot more emotional investment in your trips um, because also we've been feeling deprived. And so it's even more important that when we finally go on that first trip that um, it satisfies all those emotional needs too, and that emotional investment as well. So there's more investment as, um, in addition going forward, uh, point seven, more planning. And that's where I come in. We definitely need more planning. And there's a couple of reasons for that. It's not just because of the complexity, but even on the ground, you need to plan. You can't be spontaneous and wake up and decide you're going to go to that museum today. You now need to plan that ahead of time because the museums are timing out uh, who can come in and, and what, you know, spreading out the visitors. Same thing for historical sites. Um, same thing for even outdoor parks in some parts of the world. So everything has to be planned more than had been uh, the case in the past. And um, I, I see that also as a trend continuing until things can really ease up. Uh, point number eight. Uh, this has always been true for travel. And it's more true now. We have, need to have more patience. Um, you always have to bring your good humor and be able to take, you know, roll with the punches and have patience when you're a traveler. 
That's just a good characteristic to have as a traveler. But especially now, um, when it comes to trying to book trips, book new trips, um, you may not be able to get what you want. You might need to wait until next year because um, there are a lot of post trips that were postponed from 2020 into 2021. Some of them are being postponed again into 2022. So you may not get the exact experience that you want um, right out of the gate for your first trip post COVID. So just would want to remind you that you might need more patience because of the landscape right now. Uh, number nine is more security. Um, and I don't just mean um, financial security, although I do mean that. And I've always recommended travel insurance. I highly, highly, highly recommend travel insurance now. Um, we learned about how important that was when everything had to be un unraveled and, un and unplanned <laughs> last year. Um, but also more security to ensure your well-being while you're, excuse me, while you're on a trip. Um, the World Travel and Tourism um, Council last year were very early out of the gate creating a, a wellness stamp, a safety stamp, so that you would know if you were at a hotel that they were following the generally accepted practices uh, for safety and for well-being. So security on all fronts, not just financial security, but for your well-being as well, will stay in the forefront for the also for the foreseeable future. And then my final point is more caution um, with travel. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you have all your paperwork in order. You've got your your vaccine loaded into your app um, and so that you can board the board the plane. Um, there's two that are evolving, uh, Health Pass and Common Pass. And I, I think those are the ones that two different airlines are using and things will shake out probably around one of them. And, um, you know, and just making sure that the people that um, you're traveling with, if you're traveling in a group, are abiding by the guidelines that are set forth as generally accepted practices for safety. So, um, yeah, so that will continue as well. So from the top, more conscious, more still, more silent, more intimate, more complex, more investment, more planning, more patience, more security, and more caution. So those are the 10 points. If you want to dive deeper on that, again, there's a great blog post that I wrote. I've got some additional resources at the bottom. You can go and check those out. Um, Another interesting thing that's come up literally in the last two, literally since this morning, I, I heard a glimmer of something about this last week. Um, Senator Amy Klobuchar has a new book out on antitrust. And in the interview, she's mostly interviewed that I saw with her. She's been doing the rounds. Um, she mostly talked about um, monopolies in the area of tech and social media. But she also mentioned the travel industry. Now, this is not the travel industry that I work with, but just generally in the travel industry, these online booking engines. And she made the point that there's been some consolidation there and that the consumers may be not even aware of that. So, the, for example, Orbitz owns Triag Tri Trivago and Travelocity, and that Priceline owns Booking.com and Kayak. So he, a lot of people use these uh, search engines and... Um, the customer service is not great if something goes wrong. You can be on an 800 number forever. I, I like to say that I'm more human and more humane than my computer counterpart, which is true. Um, uh, but it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. I think if customer service was bad before the pandemic, there's been even more consolidation. And I think consumer service on um, with those kinds of tools for travel um, is going to get worse. This is not the time, in my opinion, to do it yourself, to do DIY trips. And it's certainly not the time to travel without advice because there may be, there are a lot of things I'm sure that you don't even know that you don't know. Um, in terms of the complexity, I also have access to a database that helps me um, help plan my trips for my clients, um, depending on where they're traveling from, where their passport is, issue, is issued in DC, their passports issued from all over the world among my clients as well, and where they're going. And so I can certainly provide guidance on that and navigating that, the complexity of that change of the changing landscape. That's what's going on. Interestingly though, there's two other things that I heard about today, uh, a big travel, uh, travel, uh, advisor group, a travel agency in New York, Valerie Wilson um, Travel, who actually uh, planned trips for my dad. 
and who planned my trip to Argentina in 2011, has um, been merged in with a larger uh, travel agency called Frosch. So they're going to stay independent, but work together, gives them more funding. I mean, this is probably a natural outcome of the strain that the travel industry has been under. It's one of the things that we're going to be lobbying on Capitol Hill about um, later this month. I'll be part of that as well. And then I, I saw late in the day today that Amex Global Travel, Amex Global Business Travel, has bought uh, Eugenia from the Expedia Group. And Genia, if you didn't know, is a leading uh, travel digital digital travel management company. So again, not surprising that this is happening, um, given the strain on the industry in the last year. Um, what that means for you is that having a human being, the travel industry has always been about relationships. And I can pick up the phone and get things fixed um, because of my the personal relationships that I have. Um, not just with the actual hoteliers and the resorts, but with other people in the industry who maybe then can help me um, if I don't have a personal contact. I have a huge network behind me. I'm part of the Virtuoso Consortia, and um, that gives me economies of leverage um, than an individual tourist does to help you out and to um, improve your experience. So that's all that I had for tonight. I don't know if anybody has any questions at all. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about COVID. Um, some people asked um, about specific destinations, um, about the Bahamas and Belize and Greece. And um, word was that Spain is opening to Americans um, as well as France. France was big news last week. Spain, I heard this week. The Bahamas, the different islands in the Caribbean are all different. Um, most of them make you fill out a form online. Um, sometimes that takes a while. And we, I now have a contact in the health department in the Bahamas. So if I need to get it expedited for you, I, I know somebody who I can reach out to. Um, and they've been doing that for other uh, travel uh, advisors in my network who have groups going, or families going to the Bahamas. Um, yeah, so... Okay, I don't see any questions, so I'm going to sign off for now. Tomorrow, we're going to debunk some myths about what I do and how I do it, what travel advisors do, what travel designers do. Um, we've got 10, 10 myths I think we're debunking, so we're going to talk about that, and uh, I'm excited about that as well. Oh, and I have my announcement at the end. Um, we have now launched... If you don't know where you want to go first, if you haven't, don't have a, a plethora of core and dreams with a list ready to go, um, we now have on our site, I'm very excited about this, uh, a travel quiz. You see way up, way up here, we have a travel quiz. So if you want to click on that, actually let me just show you down here. Um, yeah, let's just quick click on the travel quiz. Hang on. So this is our quiz to figure out where you want to go first. And depending on your type, and I think I'll even tell you some of the some of the possible answers. You could be a Josie, you could be an adventurer, you could be um, the Zen master, or you could be the dame slash gentleman. Um, yeah, we have six outcomes. So depending on what you get, um, I you then land on, a, on an answer page that will have um, three specific experiences for you to entertain that you probably already, kind of thing you're probably already thinking about given your travel personality. Then I offer two additional ones that maybe could help balance you out a little bit. Um, maybe you wouldn't have thought of, but maybe you'd like to consider. And then some other fun things like a recommended playlist, a must-have pack item, um, and some other fun stuff. So I encourage you to go to the site and take the quiz. It was a lot of fun to put together. And then the last thing I just want to share with you is our event on Sunday, the 16th. Again, it makes a great Mother's Day gift. We're going to Cape Town, uh, to South Africa rather, um, all over South Africa with a great partner, Hills of Africa. 
and uh, Sandy, who's the founder of Hills of Africa, is going to give us a fabulous tour um, so that we can feel like we're there, so close that we can taste it. We're also going to learn how to make chakalaka. Uh, we were, Chef Monica was in the test kitchen today uh, working on the recipe. And then you'll get a bonus recipe for to make mini Malva pudding cakes, which she tested over the weekend and I understand are very, very tasty. And then we'll go on this wonderful tour. Um, Cape Town is such a fascinating place. And um, I've been immersing myself in it and learning all about different things about Africa. So you just go here and you can register. Click on this button to register and uh, join us. It's always a lot of fun. We had a really great group. Oh, you can see what other people are saying here about our events. Um, I find them very satisfying. A lot of content um, and a lot of fun. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Let's see. Okay. Well, have a great night, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow on Cinco de Mayo Day, a.k.a. Travel Advisor Day. Bye for now.